Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be taking a look at the short novel Lady Susan by Jane Austen. Basically the idea here is that we're actually going to be taking a look at a very different style that we typically see for fiction. Now anybody who doesn't know who Jane Austen is, she's one of the most famous female writers of modern age. Some would say she's probably one of the greatest female writers, particularly in the area of romance. Jane Austen was born December 16th, 1775, and died 18 July, 1817. There are six books that are primarily attributed to her, beginning with Sense and Sensibility, Pride and Prejudice, Mansfield Park, Emma, Northanger Abbey, and Persuasion. All of these books, as you can see, were written within a six-year period, and the last two books were actually published after her death. But one of the things I also want to take a look at when discussing Jane Austen is actually taking a look at the events that were surrounding the time. Because if you notice that these are during some pretty turbulent events that are just going on. So here are a couple of the world events that are taking place during Jane Austen's lifetime. Starting with the American Revolution, starting about a couple years after she was born, until 1783. Soon after, the French Revolution took place. Now one of the things we need to keep in mind when we're talking about the French Revolution is the fact that the people that Jane Olsen was talking about were typically the gentry, as well as the lower lords. Lady Catherine in the novel Pride and Prejudice is somebody who is not necessarily somebody who has a lot of lands as we would understand for higher nobles, but still had a level of nobility attached to them. There's a term called gentry. These are lower lords who have a certain amount of prestige and they can accrue rent off of their lands so that they don't have to work. This was typical of the time. Now with the French Revolution, there was a big difference in how the different revolution affected how people saw the nobility. The French Revolution started a firestorm across the whole Europe that really caused a lot of problems because once the French Revolution died away, what ended up happening is Napoleon actually became the Emperor of France. Napoleon, who became a demagogue, sought to conquer the world through his military ability. The First War of Napoleon started in 1803. As we saw, this is very early in Jane Austen's life. When we're talking about the French Revolution, she was 14 when that took place. So when we're talking about the Napoleonic Wars, we're talking early 20s. These are massive changes in how the world functioned and how threats were perceived. When you have a looming threat like Napoleon, somebody who was able to go as far as attacking Russia, and the fact that they only were able to get to Russia but didn't overtake him is in of itself a big factor that plays into the collective consciousness of the time. Just because during the Battle of Trafalgar, where the French Navy wasn't able to defeat the English Navy, therefore preventing any sort of invasion of the UK, these are things that played in the consciousness that we don't necessarily see, but I think it was important to bring up. So let's get into the novel itself, Lady Susan. Lady Susan is only about 20,000 words. It only took a couple hours to read myself, and it's not necessarily a very dense book. So if you're looking to dip your foot into Jane Austen, this would be a good place to start. It is what is considered an epistolary novel. Basically, an epistolary novel is a series of short documents, typically. Or you could also have diary notes or battle reports as part of your story novel. And these are how the information of the story is actually brought in. Typically, when we're, we're talking about this type of story method, we're not necessarily talking about dialogue. It is all dialogue, but at the same time, not dialogue. So for instance, in this case, all of the situations are actually written in letter form. And we're going to go into a lot of these different characters and they show a lot about the characters and have some great characterization that we can use in our own stories. Lady Susan is not the only form of his pistolary novel. 
The Color Purple, World War Z, Carrie, Bridget Jones's Diary are all forms of this epistolary writing where you have either documentation of any type as the primary driving force for the story as a whole. So let's get into the actual story. Characters. Basically, I'm, I break this down into family groups. Lady Susan is our primary focus. She has a daughter, Miss Federisa Susanna Vernon. Lady Susan is about 35 years old, recently widowed. Her husband died about four months prior to the start of the story. We'll get into characterization a little bit later. Just want to give you an understanding of what's going on. Lady Susan is trying to get married again. Now, she's not necessarily wanting for money, but still having a security of having a income and having a husband is very important. Now, the way that Lady Susan goes about this is actually pretty reprehensible. Charles Vernon and Miss Catherine Vernon. This is the antagonist to Lady Susan. Lady Susan is trying to do something. Charles Vernon, primarily Catherine Vernon, is trying to prevent... Lady Susan from getting what she wants. Mrs. Catherine Vernon is actually the hero of the story. You have Sir Reginald de Courcy, Lady C. de Courcy, and then Reginald D. de Courcy as extra characters that are filled in in the back that help round out this whole situation. The primary focus for Lady Susan is actually to marry Reginald the Junior and set herself up for life. Now, Reginald, at the time of the story, is roughly about 23 years old. That is 12 years younger than Lady Susan. Next, we have Mr. Manwaring, Mrs. Manwaring, and Miss Maria Manwaring. Now, one of the things here, and, you know, spoilers for this, you know, several hundred year old book, is, is that Mr. Manwaring is actually not a good person. He's actually stepping out on his wife, Mrs. Manwaring. This comes in a little bit later on, but we also have to keep into account that the gentry don't have a lot of issues that they have to deal with on a regular basis. One of the things that I recognize whenever I read a book like this is, is that the focus of the day-to-day -day has absolutely nothing to do with survival. So for instance, you have people, particularly women, who don't have a lot of obligations that they have to see to. Not to say that, that they are necessarily lazy or anything to that effect, but what they end up putting their, their time and energy into is what would be considered gossip or these types of personal grudges or how one behaves in proper culture and all of these things that the person who is trying to survive down the road doesn't care about. One of the things about gentry and nobility as a whole is, is that they put on airs, not necessarily that they are trying to seem more important, which typically they are, but the fact is, is that in order to separate themselves from everybody else, they have to give themselves a list of behaviors that they are allowed to do. Now, this is a social thing that can be developed over the course of time in order to separate people who are willing to become socially acceptable and those who aren't. And the people who are trying to be in the in crowd, as we would say today, they are constantly trying to keep up with the changes in the fashions, but also in behaviors. Now, the behaviors are not necessarily going to be lightning fast like we would see today, but a little bit slower and way of handling different things. We're still dealing with people who are essentially selfish. So they are trying to curtail that, but it doesn't mean that it always works out. In this case, Mr. Manwaring is stepping out on his wife with Lady Susan, at least to the point of flirtation, where they are talking about getting married or at least continuing a relationship, a relationship that at its base is going to be inappropriate because he is a married man. Now, Miss Maria is also somebody who's trying to find a husband. Somebody else later on that I'll mention, he is actively trying to pursue her, but ends up being drawn away by Lady Susan, Mr. Johnson, Mrs. Alicia Johnson. These are two people that you don't necessarily see a whole lot. They aren't necessarily involved in the major body of the plot, but they become focal points later on, in addition to the fact that Mrs. Alicia Johnson is somebody who is very much on the side of 
Lady Susan, to the point where they're actually encouraging the worst habits of each other so that Lady Susan can get what she wants. That Alicia is somebody who is very much of a you go girl, do what you have to do to get what you want, to the point that when a situation comes up where they were going to go somewhere, but Mr. Johnson ended up getting sick, Alicia actually got very upset because she wasn't able to go meet up with Lady Susan. And we'll see a little bit later on their type of mindset when it comes to relationships. Now, somebody else who's important to mention is Sir James Martin. He is somebody that you end up having marrying Lady Susan after she gets rebuffed by, by Reginald de Courcy. What ends up happening is, is that Lady Susan has had her hands on Reginald for some time. Mrs. Vernon is trying to get her brother, essentially, this because they are related, away from Lady Susan because she is such a toxic person, somebody who is out for their own selves, a very selfish individual to the point that Reginald de Courcy is actually believing that Lady Susan's daughter, Miss Vernon, is actually somebody who is a bad person, a horrible daughter, because all he is doing is, is he's listening to Lady Susan. Lady Susan is a very selfish individual. This is something that is true throughout time when we have selfish people trying to act out their own desires and we have people who aren't taking into account the whole picture, they are easily led aside by the very selfish people. And we'll see that a little bit later on in one of those quotes. My dear Alicia, of what a mistake you were guilty in marrying a man of his age, just old enough to be formal, ungovernable, and to have the gout, too old to be agreeable, too young to die. This is the mindset when we have for Lady Susan, somebody who doesn't care about anybody else's desires or anybody else's well-being, but rather everybody is a means to get what she wants. And this is extended to her friend. Alicia is somebody who got married, who is secure in her marriage, but because he is not somebody that, as she says, governable, that means that it is somebody that she can't control, somebody that Alicia can't have her way with. So these are the perspectives, and chances are there's an age difference between Alicia and her husband. My thinking is, is that Lady Susan and uh, Alicia are actually the same age, so that would roughly put them about the age of 35. She came into this house to entreat my husband's interference, and before I could be aware of it, everything that you could wish to be concealed was known to him, and unluckily she had wormed out of Manwaring's servant that he had just visited you every day since your being in town, and just so watched him to your door herself. What could I do? Facts are such horrid things. This is the towards the climax of the story, where you have Mr. Manwaring is actually spending a lot of time with Lady Susan. Mrs. Manwaring finds out about this and tries to elicit help from Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson, recognizing that this is a bad situation to be in and recognizing how horrible Lady Susan is, is, is siding with Mrs. Manwaring. And so these are different types of things where we have our mindset for the characters is that facts are such horrid things. This is the point I wanted to get to with Alicia is the fact that she doesn't care about what's actually going on. She doesn't care about who is hurt or who is going to be suffering because of their actions. But this is something that she wants for Lady Susan. She wants Lady Susan to marry Mr. Manwaring. A lot of it's because he is easily controllable. He is somebody who is being led around by Lady Susan. And because Lady Susan is somebody who is easily controlling and able to get people to do what she wants, this is the type of person that she can control. These are the characterizations that we can be putting into our stories. We don't necessarily have to be very blunt about this. Facts are such horrid things is a great characterization in such a short phrase. This five words literally is facts are such horrid things, which is essentially implying that facts are getting in the way of the desire that you want, regardless of what's going on. 
Typically, people try to live their lives according to the facts, according to truth. But you're going to find people who are not in that way. They are not looking to do what they want in accordance with the fact, but rather trying to find a way of circumventing facts so that they can get what they want. A truly selfish person. I write only to bid you farewell. The spell is removed. I see you as you are. Since we parted yesterday, I have received from an indisputable authority of such a history of you as much bring the most mortifying conviction of the imposition I have been under and the absolute necessity of an immediate and eternal separation from you. As I mentioned earlier, Lady Susan was trying to marry Reginald, but while she had control of him for majority of the story, what ends up happening is, is Reginald finds out about her flirtation with Mr. Manwaring and how she was just trying to get married and she didn't care about the type of hurt and pain that she was going for. Now, this is a thing that Reginald is learning throughout the story. He's a very inexperienced person. He's only about 23. So the lies that people are willing to tell in order to get what they want, they are somebody like this is easily duped into it. The final quote, as a very distinguished flirt, I've always been taught to consider her, but it has lately fallen in my way to hear some particulars of her contact at Langford, which prove that she does not confine herself to that honest sort of flirtation which satisfies most people, but aspires to more delicious gratification of making the whole family miserable. This is Reginald's father, somebody who is very much connected and very well informed of personalities. We're given a very clear insight of the type of reaction that the flirtation that Lady Susan does and the ramifications of it. So Reginald is very clear that the whole thing is making everybody miserable, but Lady Susan does not care. One of the interesting things that I wanted to point out is the fact that the men are shown in two different camps. You have Sir Reginald, who is very active and very trying to protect his son from the, the wiles of this woman. And I use that term loosely in the case of Lady Susan. But you have the other side, people who are like Reginald, Mr. Mr. Mainwaring, Sir James. These are all people who are being led about by Lady Susan. Now, it's easy to say that these are hyperbole when it comes to what's going on with the relationship and the demographics and the situations that they're finding in. But that's not always the case. The reality is, is that you're always going to find guys who are, and the term that we would use today is simp, somebody who is more willing to give of himself without any sort of respect or reciprocity in the behavior that they are giving. These are easily characters that have been seen throughout society and throughout the literary world. So a couple things to keep in mind when we're talking about telling a story like that is, is that we need to make sure that we're telling the story in the way that it fits a arc. So you have that three act segment of how the story is supposed to progress. And we'll go over the three arc hopefully in the next video. But I want to talk about making sure that just because we're using letters or diary entries to tell the story, doesn't mean that we can throw out every system of storytelling that we have. We want to incorporate those things into how we're telling the story. Yes, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. As I've said in a previous video, we want to make sure that we're keeping the same structure because this is what our readers are expecting. If we do something too far out, particularly when we're talking about our initial story, when we're talking about our debut novel, it's a little bit different if you have a following already where you already have readers and you change things up because they like your voice. They like how you tell stories. There's a difference between when we're first starting out, we need to make sure that we're following the plans and the structures that is typical with storytelling today. So as a basic recap, one of the things that we need to keep in mind is, is that at the end of the day, people are selfish. And we can easily show in many different ways that the consequences of that selfishness. Now, sometimes we try to wrap it up and try to tell that selfishness in a beneficial light. But the problem is, is that at the end of the day, people are always going to be suffering because of selfishness. Now, I don't want to necessarily go overboard 
in this idea. But we want to make sure that when we're creating characters, particularly characters who are not pleasant, we want to make sure that we are incorporating as much selfish behavior. People have a visual reaction to people who are selfish. And depending on how we want those characters to be perceived, we can ratchet up that selfishness and we can have them disregard reality as much as possible to create a natural negative reaction to those characters. So, all right, that's all I had for today. As always, I will be linking the resources I use in the description below. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please leave it in the comment section below. Until next time, bye. I am a poor wayfaring stranger I'm traveling through this world of woe Yet there's no sickness, toil, nor danger in that bright land to which I go.